Amen. God bless you today. Uh, I know this is a different setting, but um, I decided to come into my office and uh, express what uh, is in my heart to state. I have a, a heartbeat today regarding uh, your open door. I know that uh, I've told you time and again that, uh, I, you know, God can, He will, the doors are there. But what I want to talk about is that people that have been used by God have been the most unsuspecting people in their life. And one individual I really want to express today is a, a man that uh, got set set free by God. Uh, he became a tool and God used him, but his circumstances were so different. He was a slave. God uh, still utilized him, and he became a man of great stature, anointing, blessing, and utilization by the power of God. So today I'd like you to turn with me to Exodus chapter 2. And uh, the individual I want to study today and minister to you about is a man called Moses. Moses uh, was who they call the meekest man on the earth. Uh, so Moses initially was a, just a baby and he was a slave. So I want you to turn with me to Exodus chapter 2 and follow along. I'm going to read the first 10 verses and then I want to talk about how you can change lives, <clears throat> how you can touch lives, and how you can turn uh, something that to you seems like nothing, you can turn it into something that becomes substantial, valuable, and powerful. Exodus 2. And a man of the house of Levi went and took as wife a daughter of Levi. So the woman conceived and bore a son. And when she saw that he was beautiful, a beautiful child, she hid him three months. But when she could no longer hide him, she took an ark of bulrushes for him, daubed it with asphalt and pitch, put the child in it, and laid it in the reeds of the river bank. And his sister stood afar off to know what would be done to him. Then the daughter of Pharaoh came down to bathe at the river, and her maidens walked along the riverside. And when she saw the ark, among the reeds, she sent her maid to get it. And when she opened it, she saw the child, and behold, the baby wept. So she had compassion on him and said, This is one of the Hebrews' children. Then his sister said to Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and call a nurse for you from the Hebrew women, and that uh, she may nurse the child for you? And Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Go. So the maiden went and called the child's mother. Then Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Take this child away and nurse him for me, and I will give you your, your wages. So the woman took the child, nursed him, and the child grew, and she brought him to Pharaoh's daughter, and he became her son. So she called his name Moses, saying, Because I drew him out of the water. <clears throat> Father God, I pray today that uh, you begin to transform lives, that you begin to show people open doors, that you begin to uh, instrumentally change their belief in themselves, and that you would open doors that have never been opened before and close doors that have never been closed and begin to set on a path each person 
listening to my voice today or in the future and change their lives, heal their hearts and minds, deliver them from oppression, depression, and all of the things that would hinder them from doing your work. Bless and anoint and cover today's word in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Well, here we have a very unusual circumstance where here this little baby is put in an ark and it's sealed with pitch so it won't sink and it can float in the water. And uh, so the mom, the mother, because of an order previous in the first chapter of Exodus where Pharaoh wants all of the young boys killed because they are becoming too mighty and too many. And so this mother decides to try in uh, some kind of a way of survival to put her child, her boy, in this little ark, put him in the water and have his sister, whose name is Miriam, have that sister put this baby in the water and see what becomes of it. Well, uh, as the Lord would, he guided Miriam, he took her over, got her set and uh, placed her in a position where she uh, was able to lead this baby uh, and watch over it rather and watch it come to the hands of Pharaoh's daughter. Pharaoh's daughter, Miriam comes out wisely and says, hey, do you, you want me to go get one of the Hebrew women to nurse it? Uh, so that you can keep it. And uh, Pharaoh's daughter says, yes, if you'll do that, I'll, uh, I'll bless you. So does that. And she brings, Miriam brings her own mother, who is Moses's mother. And she nurses and raises Moses without any fear of death. She had the confidence because she knew that now Moses belonged to Pharaoh's daughter. So at the end of this, she takes this baby to Pharaoh's daughter. And Pharaoh's daughter takes this little boy and raises him as her own. What a magnificent ploy and plan of the Lord and how God had plans in the future. Moses had no idea. He grew he became a part of uh, this life, uh, the life of uh, being in Pharaoh's house. And he was wealthy and he got uh, many things and he was uh, in a great place and uh, a great position. So here he does this anyway. And Moses, of course, grows and he grows up in Pharaoh's uh, kingdom as one of Pharaoh's. And as he grows, he gets older, and I don't know how old he is, but he sees a uh, one of Pharaoh's guards beating the slaves whom were Hebrews. Uh, Moses knew that he was a Hebrew, and he saw this occurring, and he went to try to stop the guard from beating these Hebrew children. And so, in turn, when he did that, they, uh, uh, he ended up killing the guard and burying the guard in the sand. And so then he comes and he talks to some of the Hebrews. Uh, and, you know, he's one of the great uh, Pharaoh's sons or relatives. And he goes and he tries to tell uh, the Hebrews not to fight amongst each other. And then they turn and they tell him, hey, wait a minute. What do you mean? Tell us not to fight amongst each other when you killed an Egyptian guard. Pharaoh free, uh, Moses freaks out, realizes this, uh, that the word's gotten out and everybody knows, and he flees for his life. And he flees and he goes to Midian. There he uh, finds people there that uh, he ends up marrying and having children and growing and becoming a sheep herder. Well, as time goes on, here he is, a nobody, sheep herder, in the desert, 
and uh, he sees the mountain in front of him and he says, how come this mountain lights up at night the way it does? And his wife told him, that's the mountain of God and God is there. And so Moses uh, goes up there to see about this uh, bush he sees, a bush that's burning and it's not being consumed. So as he goes up there and he sees it and he tells his uh, his uh, workers to wait there for him, he goes up and he meets God. How many of you have been in a place where you've met God in different circumstances, but the same idea? Well, <clears throat> what I want you to know is that there are signs everywhere. Not only are there signs, but there are doors everywhere. And many times we don't go through those doors. Many times we hold back and we, we just don't make the effort to go in and, and search and research. Well, uh, Moses went through this door. He saw the sign, went through the door, met God, and God then commands him to go to Egypt to set the people free. Moses is, uh, he's a guy that stutters. I don't know if you know that or not, but he, when he talks, he stutters. He can't even talk right. He's uh, a meek man. He's not a, a guy that fights people, etc. So he goes ahead and he does what God tells him to do, sets the people free, all the slaves sets them free, and they are free to go into the desert and go and find the promised land and live their lives in freedom. Moses, stutterer, a murderer, and a guy that uh, just doesn't have a, a lot going for him, he leads three and a half million people for 40 years in the desert. I don't know if you can even imagine that, leading 40 people in a desert for 40 years. But he led three and a half million people. He became the lawgiver. He was the only man to be able to see the back of God. That's powerful. Not only that, but uh, he was the man of God that crossed the Red Sea on dry ground. Took three and a half million people across an ocean or a sea, the Red Sea, on dry ground from one side of Egypt over to Cana. Powerful. What a magnificent man of God. Not only does he do that, but he's the man that... Uh, He's the one that creates Passover. He's the one that uh, uh, began to bring manna, or he called on God, and he brought, God gave them manna from heaven. Uh, he's the one that spoke to a rock, and water came out of it. He's the one that received the law of God. He's the one that had them design the tabernacle. He's the one that had men design and build the Ark of the Covenant. He's the one that first enacted sacrifices. He, in, in the, the, in the uh, Hebraic rule and law, <clears throat> he was uh, the meekest man on the earth. He trained Joshua, and he did many more things beyond that. I just want you to know, that somewhere in your life you have a gift. Somewhere in your life you have a door. Somewhere in your life there's an anointing. Somewhere upon you there's something in you that says go. And God wants to use you. It may not be you, but it may be the person that you speak to that changes the world. It may be the person you speak to and minister to and they get saved and then you go forward and you are the one that by the second individual, that person you prayed for goes to another person and they become the person that transforms 
the world. I don't know, but I do know that God has his hand on your life. <clears throat> I want to talk today about a, a word that a man named uh, Dr. Clarence Sexton had given. But uh, there were some other facts beyond what Clarence Sexton had, had stated that I want to tell you about. I want to talk about a man named Duncan Campbell. Duncan Campbell was uh, a great revivalist in the Scotland uh, Isles and in Scotland itself. Well, Duncan Campbell, what he did was he spoke of this Bible, Clarence Sexton rather, spoke of this Bible that came to be of great value. In the early 1900s on the Isle of Herbides or the Isle of Lewis, there came a revival that was orchestrated by Duncan Campbell. Prior to this revival, there were two very senior women named Peggy and Christine Smith, 82 and 84 years old. They were desperate for revival from the Isle of Lewis. One of the ladies was blind and the other was touched by spinal spinotis or uh, uh, <clears throat> an issue with her back that was humped and uh, she couldn't walk very well. And these two ladies were hungry for revival. They began to pray in their home due to the state of life in the Isle of Lewis. People had forgotten God. They forgot religion. Uh, they forgot wh who God was and how to serve him. Well, uh, they found a scripture in the word of God. And in this scripture... It said, For I will pour water on him who is thirsty and floods on the dry ground. I will pour my spirit on your descendants and, on, and my blessings on your offspring. Isaiah 44, 3. They began to pray twice a week, Tuesday and Friday at 10 p.m., and they would pray until three in the morning, four in the morning. One day, the, la the, the Lord gave one of the ladies a vision of the church. And in this vision, they saw the church was crowded. Young people were at the doors trying to get in. And it was packed. And, at the, and the doors were packed. And no one could get in because there were so many people. And a strange minister was standing in the pulpit. <clears throat> One of the ladies was so moved by this vision that they called on their minister to pray with them. And so what he did is he went and pray, called on his elders to join him. And because the, the uh, two ladies, their home, the sister's home was so small, that they couldn't crowd a lot of people in there, the minister decided to go to a barn and begin to pray. And what he did was he called his elders to come in and join him. And as they got together and they joined in that barn and they prayed the same hours and the same days. And as uh, they began to do this and these elders complied, they prayed for one and a half months. And as they called on God for those one and a half months, night after night, every Tuesday and every Friday, they just sought the face of God. Well, <clears throat> as they were calling out to God, one of the young men who was in the barn began to cry out to God. And he stood up and he read Psalms 24. And this stirs me because this psalm I ministered on a couple of weeks ago. And it's Psalms 24. It says, Who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord? Or who shall stand in his holy place? He that hath clean hands and a pure heart, 
who hath not lifted up his soul unto vanity, nor sworn deceitfully. He shall receive the blessing from the Lord. Not a blessing, but the blessing. And when that young man closed his Bible, and looking down at the ministers and the elders, he spoke these crude words. It seems to me to be so much humbug to be praying as we are praying, to we be waiting as we are waiting. If we ourselves are not rightly related to God, and then he lifted his two hands and prayed, God, are my hands clean? Is my heart pure? Then the Holy Ghost fell and revival broke loose in that building. And uh, as the revival began to build, people in the town began to become aware of God and lives began to draw to God. One of the ladies spoke to the minister to find a minister outside of their parish. Well, that week the minister was going to a convention in Scotland and he found a young student and requested him to come for 10 days to preach. He said, no, I can't. But in Glasgow, there is a man named Campbell. It should be called. Campbell had had a hard time leaving Edinburgh, which was in Scotland. And it was a college called Edinburgh. And uh, because at that particular time, God started breaking loose in Scotland, in that college in Edinburgh. Well, he decided to go to ten day, go for the 10 days. And uh, later, he arrived on a steamship. And uh, the minister told Campbell he would get his bed and dinner. But if he would just address the crowd at the church first, well, God began to move in such a great in powerful way that multitudes of souls came to Christ. The Herbities and much of Scotland got saved. People would come into uh, farmland and they would just draw there and not even know why they went and begin to pray and call out to God. People would gather in barns all over the Herbities Islands and they'd begin to cry out to God. They'd begin to speak to God. They'd begin to praise God and sing songs and worship God. They begin to get together in coffee shops, in stores, in homes, and in that church in the Isle of, of Lewis. Church, I'm telling you that God began to move in such a way through Duncan Campbell that that entire island got saved. Everybody on the island got saved. I'm talking thousands of people, church. Thousands. I want to hear from Pastor Gabe Mestis now. He has a word for you. Thank you. Yes, amen, church. So good to see everybody online. Just really miss you guys. You know, I was just thinking and praying, and with all that's going on, I, I just feel like we need to learn to trust God's plan. We're, we have to learn it in all aspects of our lives. You know, I'm learning that. I'm learning how to trust God and trust His plan and all the things that we go through. It's funny because when you start exercising your faith, it's not always the smoothest looking thing. It's not always the best looking. Sometimes we mess up and fail. You know, I'm starting to realize what the disciples went through when they were on the boat. They were with Jesus on the boat when the storm came. And when that storm came, they were with Jesus. They were with the Son of God. They were with God Himself. And yet they still panicked. But ultimately, they trusted God. When they were panicking, they went down into the belly of the boat and they grabbed Jesus. See, church, sometimes we're going to have issues. Sometimes we're going to panic. Sometimes we're not going to know what's going on. 
but we need to turn to Jesus. We need to turn to Christ. We need to turn to his word. And that's when we will get that comfort and that reassurance. And just as Christ calmed the storms, he will calm the storms in our lives. But we need to learn to trust him. We need to learn to trust the process of reading the word, of prayer, and reaching out to the Lord. So love you guys, miss you. Now let's see what Pastor Mike has to say. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Gabe. Now what I want to do is I want to begin to finish this story that took place in the Herbides Islands by Reverend Duncan Campbell. Duncan Campbell was a man of fire, and for three and a half years, that revival went on. Well, during the revival there, there was a young boy, and his name was Donald Smith. Well, Donald Smith became uh, he was so on fire for God that Duncan Campbell recognized his power and anointing. And what he did was he asked uh, Donald Smith to become his protege. So Donald Smith began to uh, help in that revival. Donald Smith was uh, a nephew to Peggy and Christine Smith, who were the two senior ladies that uh, started that revival through prayer on that island. And uh, Duncan Campbell uh, saw this fire in this young man. The Campbell decided to have him pray and help frequently during this revival. Well, this fire spread amongst the believers in such a great way that there was a young girl named Mary and Smith McLeod, who was a cousin to Donald Smith and a niece to Peggy and Christine Smith. Well, I just want you to know that uh, this lady, I studied this out extensively. I studied out the revival and a lot of these words and notes I received through the writings of Duncan Campbell. And uh, nonetheless, this young lady, Marianne Smith McLeod, who was Donald Smith's cousin, was so impressed by the move of God in her hometown of the Isle of Lewis. And uh, even though she moved back into America in 1933, she frequented Tong, that, that town that was on the Isle of Lewis, where she grew up with her aunts, Peggy and Christine, and her cousin, Donald Smith. And uh, there was such an influence and an affection between Peggy and Christine Smith, her aunts, uh, that they were uh, so impressed and, and in love with Mary Ann that they sent Mary Ann a Bible from uh, the Isle of Herbides. This Bible was used during that time, which was in 1949, that revival. Well, during this period of time, Marianne uh, Smith moved to America and she met a man named Fred. Well, her and Fred fell in love and they married. And uh, with all that was taking place, uh, she married Fred in 1942, and they had their first child, who was a, a girl, and they named her Marianne after Mother Marianne Smith. And uh, then they had another son. His name was Fred. And uh, that uh, young man, his name was Fred. They called him Frederick. And that was Marianne's uh, name of her husband and their first son. Then they had a third child, and this child was named Elizabeth. And finally, they had a fourth child, a son, and uh, who was born to Mary Ann Smith. And this uh, little boy so impacted uh, Mary Ann uh, that 
her, Marianne, being a cousin, and this young man, Donald, who helped, Duncan Campbell, she was so moved by Donald Smith, her cousin, because of what happened in that revival in the Herbides Islands. And she named this young boy Donald, the, the last of their sons, of, uh, before they had one final son, Robert. But Donald uh, was that boy that uh, she named after Donald Smith. And she had been moved with such emotion that she decided uh, to give this Bible to her fourth child, Donald. Donald uh, received that Bible, and today that Bible sits in the Oval Office. And today that Donald that was named by Marianne Smith is none other than the 45th president of the United States, Donald J. Trump. I'm telling you, church, that through a revival back in 1949 that went on for three and a half years, and through the impact that was made through Duncan Campbell and who stirred this young man, Donald Smith, and who was enact, who all of this was enacted by Peggy and Christine Smith, who all were related, except for Duncan Gamble, to Mary Ann Smith, who then married Fred Trump, who then had a son, Donald Trump Jr., or Donald Trump Sr., and Donald Trump is now the President of the United States. Church, God can move in all circumstances. God wants to move through you. God wants you to know that hidden in history, hidden in your life, hidden somewhere, somehow, some way, that there's a powerful man of God, woman of God, child of God, that is in your line, or you may be that child of God, that God wants to use to turn the world upside down. Don't ever think that you're not usable. Don't ever think that you're not a tool. Don't ever think that you, like Moses, hidden, cannot become a Moses. Or you, like Donald Trump, can become the President of the United States. I'm telling you, church, there's a supernatural change, transformation. There's a move here. There's a purpose here. There's a reason here. And God is moving right now. Could faith be your direction? Could you eventually inspire someone to serve the living God who could change the world? Who is your connection? What is your direction? Where are you headed? Isaiah 44, 3 says this to you today, my child. For I will pour water on him who is thirsty and floods on the dry ground. Oh, you may be dry ground today, church, but I'm telling you that God wants to fertilize your heart. God wants to fertilize your life. God wants to fertilize your spirit. He wants to change your path, and he wants to set you on a God path. It's your time, it's your day, and it's your period to move. I challenge you today, open your heart and let God make you that tool. Father, I pray right now for those that are listening. I pray for the lost and the brokenhearted. I pray for their souls. I pray for their lives. Father, change the situation. Change their hearts and change their lives. Oh, how we love you, Father, how we worship and honor you. And I pray that you use tools in the hearts of people, that you stir their anointing, that you awaken them to the Moses connection. Awaken them to the Spirit of God and let them see that such a time as this, they are called out to do a mighty work for you, Father. Father, I bless you. Father, I honor 
and I worship you in Jesus' mighty name. If you want to give your heart to Jesus this morning, and you want to open it up, and you want God to do something supernatural, and you want to get saved, you may be a backslider, you may be lost, you may never have prayed, you may never have been saved. Pray this with me right now and enter into the joy of the Lord, the kingdom of heaven. Say, Dear Lord, I admit that I'm a sinner and I ask Jesus, come into my heart, save me, change me, and set me free. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.